This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Fees and generous donations from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to the Amherst Weekly Report from Amherst Media. I'm Claire Healy and these are the biggest stories out of Amherst, Massachusetts from this past week. A new 28 apartment affordable housing complex on Northampton Road was approved on November 12th with a unanimous vote from the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. The current single family house will be torn down to make way for the two and a half story building designed by Valley Community Development, a nonprofit organization based in Northampton that works in affordable housing for low income families. The board asked that 70% of the units be set aside for local residents to purchase and there are a number of conditions and need-based criteria set for people to live there. Of the 28 units, 10 units will be made available for rent at or below 30% of the area median income with preference for currently houseless individuals. Two units will be available for rent at or under 30% of the area median income under the Facilities Consolidation Fund eight at or below 50% of the area median income, and another eight units for rent at or below 80% of the area median income. The 20-day appeal process has started, in which the public or board can appeal the decision. The Town Council unanimously approved the selection of six residents to serve on the Community Safety Working Group. This group will ultimately consist of nine members and examine how public safety functions in Amherst and focus on ensuring racial justice is prioritized in policing. The initial proposal for the group states that at least six of the nine voting members will represent black, indigenous, people of color, or other historically marginalized communities. A written proposal on public safety changes will be submitted to Amherst Town Manager Paul Bockelman by January 15th, and further recommendations on policy reforms for the police department will be submitted by June 30th. We were able to speak with half of the newly appointed members about their goals for the working group and what they hope it achieves. Pat Anonabaku has been an Amherst resident for over 35 years, has five children that went through the Amherst school system, and runs the Baku Care Adult Day Health Center in Hadley, working with adults and elderly with disabilities. She was a founding member of Race and Discipline Action Rights, or RADAR, a group looking to end racial disparity in school discipline and served from 2004 to 2008 on the Racial Profiling Committee created by the town. I must have resources and I will hope that um, I must will think about uh, getting uh, a space for youth, for after school programming, um, mentorship program, and um, employment skills for our, for our youth of color. One of the things I hope I will propose is to find a way to recognize police officers who are not targeting uh, people of color, especially black men. And also, I, I think that reforming police um, in our midst is overdue and some, some resources should be allocated to housing. We have some homeless population and sometimes the uh, calls to police is something that could be resolved through social services. Um, mental health calls, I think um, we could have like social workers and skilled mental health professionals who can assist the police in uh, providing alternative services, including domestic violence too. Tashina Bowman is a mom of seven boys and a student midwife and doula. She is an Amherst resident and says she is deeply invested in this group and its work. My family has had one experience um, specifically with um, the Amherst police and, um, and then that was a um, make mistaken identity, I don't know how you want to call it, but it was basically um, they detained my son. Um, when he was walking on New Year's Eve to go see his girlfriend who was sick at home. Um, and that really got me in a place where I was like, um, Amherst 
Amherst really needs to be held accountable because we're a small town. And our um, public service people really need to know their community. And I really want to work on finding a way to make them more involved. Um, we've had officers in particular in the past that kind of everybody knew um, showed up to sporting events, so on and so forth. Like, you know, and I just feel like if our um, officers have more information about our community, but also had, um, were held responsible for being part of, like actually part of our community and not just policing our community, then we, um, we can, you know, forge a better relationship. I also feel like um, there's a huge level of education that doesn't happen um, with town governments that really needs to be addressed. Um, history of why the police were originally invented, like, or like in, in this country, like in having an understanding that there's a really um, detrimental unspoken history that goes along with policing and what that meant to be a police, you know, to be policing and how in other countries it's very different. And in this country, it's, it's based, you know, it's based on a very um, racist, you know, um, it has a very racist history. I just want to be part of that voice. I want to be part of that change because, um, it can really set, it can really change the tone of what's happening in our community if, you know, people are being held accountable, but I really think accountability is not just about discipline again, it's about learning, it's about growing, it's about and making a stronger community. And so that's why I think this is really important for me to be involved. Invested, I wanna see the next, the generations coming up feel that they are safe and feel that they, um, are respected in their community. Paul Wiley is an Amherst resident and formerly served for 18 years as principal of the Crocker Farm Elementary School. He recently served as interim head of school for the Common School. We have a, a, a very uh, big charge in front of us to really get a grasp on what the needs of this community are with respect to uh, safety and well being of all the individuals that live in this community. Um, especially around the um, the whole notion of policing and how that works uh, or should work for us. So my my reason for joining the committee is that I feel after being here for so many years, I'm I'm invested in this community and uh, wanted to contribute in a different way at this point and be a part of a group that's looking deeper into what the needs of the community are with respect to safety. Um, it's, it's my personal goal, certainly, to bring as much uh, expertise and experience and energy to the work as I possibly can. And the global, you know, work for our, our community is to uh, build better relationships across this community in ways that contribute to the safety and well-being of uh, everyone in our community. And I think this is the group that may uh, actually promote all the kinds of things that we need to do to make this a, a, a safer place on a number of different levels for everyone. We will certainly, uh, we will be reaching out to the community certainly to uh, let them know and they'll be able to access information through the, the town government certainly. But as we start moving forward with our work agenda, uh, we hope to be very uh, public uh, very engaged with the community, and uh, you know we're we're looking forward to get a lot done in well it'll probably be a short amount of time, but we're 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 going to get it done. So like I said, we're just starting. So um, that's that's the goal. Every year, Monte Bellamonte leads his annual Monte's March, 43 miles from Greenfield to Springfield, in order to raise funds to combat hunger in the region and awareness of the extent of food insecurity. This year is no exception, and a masked march will take place November 23rd and 24th, with all proceeds going to the Massachusetts Food Bank. Monty, 
Congressman Jim McGovern, and Food Bank Executive Director Andrew Morehouse will join supporters in the march, which aims to raise $365,000, which would provide 4,000 meals a day for a year. We spoke with Congressman McGovern about the fundraiser and his goals following his re-election. I'm honored to represent the people of the 2nd Congressional District, and uh, you know, I am humbled by their support, and I'm looking forward uh, to the next session of Congress with a new president. And we need to help help our restaurants get through this difficult time. We need to help small businesses. We need to help individuals who are struggling. We need to address issues like hunger. And that is we ought to boost up SNAP benefits for people during this difficult time. We need to support our first responders. We need to support our doctors and our nurses. We need to make sure we have enough PPE so that people can deal with this, with this surge. We need to make sure that um, we are doing everything we can to get a plan in place, not only for testing and tracing, but to provide people with a, a, a vaccine um, as soon as it is uh, available. You know, look, uh, this week, uh, you know, Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris created a national uh, testing plan that they wanted to uh, unveil to, to tell the American people how they will go about this. But, uh, you know, what I'm hopeful about the new incoming administration is they understand that you need a plan, that we need to do something. I mean, Trump has walked away. Um, and, you know, as we are talking right now, the number of deaths in our country is over 250,000 people. That is, that is criminal. Uh, and millions and millions of people have been uh, impacted by the virus, uh, who luckily have survived. But 250,000 of our fellow citizens ha have died as a result of this uh, terrible thing. So uh, but Congress needs to provide the resources and we need to provide a plan that can be implemented in all 50 states as quickly as possible. Uh, SNAP is a premier anti-hunger program in this country, but it's inadequate. The average SNAP benefit is about $1.40 per person per meal. Uh, you can't even buy a Dunkin' Donuts coffee for that. Uh, so we need to do better on the federal level and expand the benefit. Uh, we also need to reverse some of the Trump rules, which have thrown needy people off of the benefit, including a lot of veterans. And one of the things that I'm going to call on uh, President Biden uh, to do uh, is to have a White House conference on food, nutrition, and hunger. We can bring everybody who has any role uh, together to actually figure out how we, how we can solve the problem of hunger. Monty's March is taking place the Monday and Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, and uh, I've been doing it for many, many years now. When I began representing this district, I, I joined in the march. When I first started, the march was 17 miles long. Now it's 43 miles long. Uh, but we, 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 we do this walk over two days. We raise awareness about hunger in our community because hunger exists uh, in every single city and town in Massachusetts and all across the country. And we raise money for the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts. Look, while we're fighting to get the federal government to do more to combat hunger, while we're fighting for better wages for people so they don't have to worry about affording nutritious food for their families, we need to support the Food Bank, uh, which does an incredible job of making sure uh, people, especially those in rural areas, have access to good nutrition. Look, this is about supporting, you know, our neighbors in our community. People have been hit hard by this pandemic. I mean, hunger was a problem before the pandemic. It is much, much worse uh, as a result of this pandemic. People are struggling. And until we can get a stimulus package passed, until we can, you know, get a, a working government in place that will put people first, um, we need to support our local organizations like the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts. So I would urge everybody, you know, to, you know, to follow us online, to, you know, to donate to the Food Bank, you know, to, you know, to, to help really show what a generous and decent and honorable community we really are. Uh, I hope you'll drive by and give us a wave or a beep and some moral support. But uh, we'll follow the march. Please donate. Please be generous uh, because it's about helping our neighbors. The Corona Center for Peace Building is hosting a lecture, workshop, and dialogue series called Erasure and Restoration, an understanding of past and present in the Connecticut Valley's Indigenous communities. Events are facilitated by Indigenous people and non-Indigenous allies, exploring history, culture, and lived experiences according to Karuna's website. In addition to this speaker series, the Karuna Center is establishing working groups where participants act in allyship to support Native-led initiatives for restoring justice and repairing harms. We spoke with Christina Downing, Program Associate with the Karuna Center, 
about these working groups and what they're meant to accomplish. It came about when we were really organizing the series. Um, we had hosted a series last year that was about uh, reparations and memorialization for slavery. Um, and in that series, it came out that there was a huge gap in understanding about the history of Native people in this area, um, and also just a gap in the conversation around reparations or memorialization or any kind of justice really towards Native people. So the idea for the series came out of that. Um, and then as we started conceptualizing the series and thinking about who was going to speak um, and what kind of things we wanted to learn more about, uh, we realized that we also really wanted to kind of have some kind of uh, engine for taking some of these things that we've learned and putting them into action. So being a support to the Native community. The working groups, um, we have some ideas for initiatives that we would really like the working groups to focus on. And we hope that some of those ideas are made apparent through the series. So for example, we have uh, some workshops coming up around land justice, and we're working with local land trusts and conservation groups to think about um, how to move from just land conservation to actual land justice. So we have some ideas around that. Um, we also have some ideas around decolonizing uh, cur curriculums and education, and we've got workshops coming up around that. But at the same time, um, we're really trying and hoping to follow the lead of Native organizations and Native people who are already working on these initiatives. And we are kind of entering into these working groups um, with an open mind. So we're hoping that the groups that we actually um, convene, that they'll really look towards Native leadership in our community to determine what the action steps are that are best to take. Um, and while we have some ideas for that, we also, uh, we want people to do what feels interesting to them in order to really kind of facilitate more engagement and more excitement about this opportunity. We also spoke with Ron Welburn, project scholar for the series and a member of the advisory committee. Uh, I am not of this area, but I have what I could call, let's say, distant cousins. Uh, while I have pretty much identified as Cherokee much of my life, uh, my Cherokee ancestors have, uh, they migrated during the 1820s over to the Virginia Eastern Shore, which is about as, you know, you can't go any further than you're into the Atlantic Ocean. And um, intermarried with an Algonquin group known as the Accomacs, and the, who were living on the uh, Genghiskin or Genghiskin Reservation in uh, Northampton County, of Virginia. And I happen to have been born in Bryn Mawr College Hospital uh, and uh, raised in Berwyn and in Philadelphia. So uh, what I'm going to be talking, that's kind of my background uh, as far as culturally is concerned. I've been teaching. I'm now retired from UMass Amherst. I was in the English department. I um, retired from there after 27 years. I helped start the Native American Studies certificate program at UMass, which is actually in the anthropology department. And I served as its director for nine years. So as in terms of the scholarship and, 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 and you know, the scholarly role that I have, it's a matter of making sure that, well, accuracy for one thing, accuracy as much as possible. I know that a lot of people in terms of when you start, when you, when you begin talking about history, you, you know, you say that, well, what is history? How can it, you avoid, let's say, circumstantial evidence, um, shadow of a doubt uh, kinds of uh, instances? And when you're talking about um, native life and, and, and so forth, it's not that easy to nail things down. Uh, you know, there are people who have come through oral traditions, uh, oral traditions that are handed down, but um, a lot of it, you know, even the, those accounts that have been written down, uh, you have to scrutinize them very carefully to find out exactly what's going on. And, you know, I, I grew up um, trying to learn as much as I could when I was a small kid uh, about my, not just my own native heritage, but the, the peoples, especially those who were living in the eastern half of the country. And uh, I was quite 
surprised when I started uh, joining the Bruchaks on the, oh golly, 40 years ago and more, uh, on the powwow circuit. And we were selling books and all of a whole lot of stuff just sort of, wow. I, I mean, I just, what I had retained was, was just remarkable. So, uh, you know, it hasn't been easy for us, but I'm not going to make a big deal out of the, that kind of, let's say, hardship. Uh, because we're here to, to carry on, and I feel that um, we owe our responsibilities to our peoples and to uh, to the earth itself, to Mother Earth itself. There's so much filled with Mother Earth is crying, and I think that she wants her stories and our, uh, the stories that we have about her and with her and because of her uh, brought forth at this particular time. As for what he hopes comes of the series... He said he wants people to understand more about the histories and the people who were here before the Europeans arrived and what happened as a result of the colonization and genocide against indigenous people. And I would like to see more in the way of uh, these kinds of teaching initiatives that would go on in the junior high schools, middle schools especially, certainly in, in the lower grades too, but certainly in high school, uh, taking more of what we could call an indigenous approach to uh, the, uh, uh, the backgrounds of a particular area. Uh, it's good that people want to learn from Native people, and I hope that that kind of expands, as well as the fact that I wouldn't want to see it just learn it for Native American History Month or Native American Month, and then we shut the door and go into Santa Claus and go into something else. You know, we, um, uh, we have survived and we've managed, and. Uh, I don't think that many of us are going to be forgetting, especially with these kinds of programs. These are memory programs also. It's very important to keep the memories going and sometimes to stoke the fires of memory, those little embers, uh, because uh, that's where the knowledge is. That's where everything starts to become crystallized in the minds and, and hearts. And uh, that's where we have to, to, that's where the work is. So, and it's beautiful. People interested in getting involved in this series can learn more on the Karuna Center's website. Following a large-scale outbreak at the MCI Norfolk facility, in which over 150 prisoners tested positive, or about 1 in 10 inmates, according to reporting by WBUR, the issue of COVID-19 in prisons has gained renewed interest, all while case numbers have risen across the state. Executive Director of the Prisons Legal Services of Massachusetts, or PLSMA, Elizabeth Matos, has been working to ensure that the rights and safety of incarcerated individuals have been and continue to be maintained amid the pandemic. Matos explains that while prisons and jails are secure facilities, they act as an incubator for the virus due to confined close quarters. She said that a lack of proper mask usage and sanitary conditions only amplifies the risk to not only prisoners, but correctional officers and staff, as well as the larger community. Um, but it is true that it didn't hit every facility the same. This is, it's very different. Um, you have to think of prisons and jails as being, you know, just by nature uh, or by definition, they're highly secure settings, right? And controlled settings. So theoretically, if you're being very precautious, um, and uh, in taking all measures possible, then it's possible to not have an outbreak in a prison or a jail. We already know that social distancing is a must for keeping the virus at bay once people are infected. And so that's why we're getting these new executive orders from the governor limiting um, you know, social gatherings and, and all kinds of things to really enhance the social distancing piece, not just the mandatory mask, you know, mandate. So it's not just about mask wearing and hand sanitizer, it's also about social distancing. And if you can't social distance in a prison or a jail, which is pretty antithetical to prisons and jails, then once it gets in, and then you really have a problem. The PLSMA has been working with the governor's office legislatures, and the Department of Correction, among others, to file lawsuits and promote systematic advocacy for prisoners so that they now get access to masks and hand sanitizer. However, Matos noted this has not been an easy task. 
So it's been very difficult to have standards applied to the human beings that live in our prisons and jails um, that are on par with the standards that are being applied elsewhere in the state, including nursing homes and colleges and universities and, and things like that. If we really care about pe keeping people safe, then we should care about keeping all people safe and, and make sure that those things are adhered to. So a lot of our work has been around just elevating the humanity of this population. It's unfortunately much um, you know, easier said than done. Still many challenges remain, particularly concerning elderly prisoners with underlying conditions. Earlier this year, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts before the unexpected passing of the late Chief Justice Ralph D. Gantz, wrote in a concurring opinion, according to Matos, quote, the DOC and the parole board really had to do all in its power to start releasing people and take precautions to minimize the population and minimize the impact of the virus if there were to be a second wave. Matos explains that since then, quote, none of that has been done, including releasing individuals within the last five months of their sentence, or using home confinement as a mechanism, whereas other states, such as New Jersey, have already begun to significantly reduce the size of their prison populations. State Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, for the 1st Hampshire District, which encompasses Northampton, filed a bill in March to specifically address these issues between the coronavirus and DOC facilities called decarceration in COVID-19. Sabadosa said her inspiration to write the legislation, which is currently still pending on Beacon Hill, came from seeing what other countries had done to depopulate the size of their prisons and jails, in addition to a memo issued by the District Attorneys for the State of New York concerning COVID in state correctional facilities. Sabadosa's bill goes further than the SJC ruling, which largely pertains to those being held on pretrial, in that it specifically addresses vulnerable and nonviolent individuals who have already been sentenced or who are awaiting parole. Um, I was speaking to someone the other day who's been awaiting parole for five months now. He is currently COVID positive. He is at Norfolk Prison. Um, he's serving a, a very lengthy sentence uh, because he was sentenced on a three strikes ruling. So um, basically, if he had not had prior, they were both drug related convictions, he um, it suffers from addiction. If he had not had those two prior convictions very early in life, this third charge later in life um, would have only been two years. He's now served 13 years. Um, so he's definitely someone that you know should qualify for parole, has not yet had a decision, and now is unfortunately sick. The representative added, even if her legislation is not passed, action must be taken, and she pointed to a lack of action from the executive branch. Sabadosa explained Governor Charlie Baker could unilaterally institute decarceration policies that would expedite this process of releasing prisoners through parole and home confinement, which Sabadosa says the state is supposed to have guidelines for. I think that politically, there's often a lot of fear when it comes to doing anything around criminal justice reform. You know, historically, Massachusetts has become more and more conservative over the years in the way we treat people who are incarcerated. I think that the governor, while he has done a good amount of work and is supportive of programs around reentry, has not always made the connection that successful reentry also depends upon successful a successful period of incarceration. You need to treat people as if they are human if you want them to then leave prison and be able to reintegrate into society, find a job, reconnect with their families. And our prison system currently puts up a lot of barriers to that. Um, it's hard for, I think, politicians to say, yep, there should be home confinement because there's always the, the question of, well, what if something goes wrong? The flip side of that is we're not looking at, well, something is going wrong in our prisons and we're not doing anything about that out of fear of potentially something bad happening if someone is released. Sabadosa stressed that, quote, the statistics speak for themselves. In terms of individuals who have either finished their prison sentences or who are paroled, not reoffending upon return to normal life in their communities, and that the success stories outweigh those who do reoffend. The legislation also calls for an individualized case by case review, particularly concerning sentenced individuals already eligible for parole who qualify for medical parole. For example, those 50 plus with underlying conditions 
and those nearing the end of their sentences. I know that there are people who say we should simply open the doors and burn down prisons and not have anything like that. And I can understand with the, the frustrations we have with the criminal justice system why you would take that view. But the legislation is not that bold, quite honestly. Um, the legislation asks for a review. It asks for the Department of Corrections to weigh dangerousness versus risk to public safety and health. Because if you have a prison in a community where there's there is a spiking number of cases. As I sort of insinuated before, the only people who are moving in and out of those prisons are the people who work there. That means they're bringing illness into the prison, but they're also bringing illness back to their families, into the towns, into the schools, into the hospitals. It creates hot spots, and we don't need that or want that in the state. And so if you can go through, depopulate, keep people socially distanced, keep people in clean maths, masks, have in, have enough resources to do all of those things, it doesn't just benefit the people who are incarcerated, it benefits all of us. If someone has six months left in their sentence, then it feels like, well, it's a no-brainer. You know that you know, there are cases in prisons and people are getting sick. Why don't we just release the people that we're going to release in a few months anyway? And yet there's um, a very strong pushback to know people must finish like every last minute of their sentences. And it, I think, speaks to a really sad situation where we are only viewing incarceration as punitive. We don't view it as rehabilitative at all. And that uh, it doesn't lead to successful reentry, quite frankly. As the situation currently stands in Western Massachusetts, Sabados explained there are no current positive cases as of earlier this week at the Hampshire County Jail and House of Corrections. However, one person who was hospitalized became COVID positive and several staff who were exposed are now quarantining. In nearby Hamden County, several COVID cases remain active in DOC facilities, according to Sabadosa but she noted there have been data discrepancies between the DOC's website versus data required to be reported by the SJC. Sabadosa added, quote, the court did very little early on, incarcerating people during a pandemic without taking the necessary precautions can rise to a human rights violation. The representative stressed seeing the humanity in the state's prison populations, particularly during the pandemic, when these groups remain at risk. I think that we a lot of times like to pretend we don't know people who are incarcerated. It's not us, it's them. We create that divide. It's just not true. And so when you break that down, you know, we're talking about our, our sisters and our brothers and our parents and our children and grandparents and you know, uncles and aunts. We all know somebody who has been incarcerated because we live in a country where we incarcerate a lot of people. When you think of it that way, when you think of this as members of your community, then it's a lot harder to say, it doesn't affect me. As students at UMass living in the Amherst area end their fall semester, they are being encouraged to get testing for COVID-19 within 72 hours of their planned departure so as not to potentially spread the virus to their families this holiday season. The reminder comes in an email to all students from Jeffrey Hescock, the UMass Executive Director of Environmental Health and Safety, and Ann Becker, the UMass Public Health Director. This advice lines up with updated health guidance from Governor Charlie Baker to colleges and universities concerning students' travel plans. UMass will continue to test students, faculty, staff, and these individuals' spouses and dependents over the course of the winter break with modified hours. The new hours for asymptomatic testing begin Monday, November 23rd at the Mullen Center and will occur on a regular basis Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. with some exceptions. Testing will not occur on November 25th and 26th, which coincide with the Thanksgiving holiday. In addition to December 23rd and 24th in the lead up to Christmas Day, as well as December 30th and 31st for Christmas for New Year's Eve. Testing is free for all those who qualify, and results are delivered within 24 to 36 hours. Currently, the modified testing schedule runs until January 7, 2021, but UMass noted, as the spring semester nears, it may establish additional operating hours and related updates. With Thanksgiving just around the corner, we sent AWR correspondent Melissa Nieves-Torres out to talk with folks about what they're thankful for this holiday season. 
Thanks, Claire. I'm here in downtown Amherst today talking to local residents about what they are especially grateful for as we head into the Thanksgiving season. Although dining room tables across the United States might look a bit different today and some annual holiday festivities might be canceled, Amherst residents have found ways to still remain grateful and thankful for everything this year. I'm just so grateful for my friends, really, and people who I can, even if I can't spend time with them in person right now, that I can just call. Yeah. I'm thankful for my health and I'm grateful to be alive. Um, and I'm just grateful for, you know, every day that I'm alive. Um, I'm extremely thankful for the fact that I still have the opportunity to access online learning in this crazy time because I know it's been a real struggle for a lot of students. Um, and I'm just thankful to be healthy and able to pursue what I want this semester and stay active and be around my loved ones and overall just help for sure. For today I'm thankful for a beautiful sunny day. <laughs> thankful for being able to continue to serve the community and uh, be, able to keep, be able to keep working through the pandemic and that no one in my family has been directly affected by the pandemic. So to uh, be able to travel to see my family. It's been like almost a year since we've been here, so it's nice to be able to come back and uh, see my sister and my parents are around here somewhere. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah. I agree with that. We're taking a lot more time off this year than we would have normally, so um, we're spending a good three weeks, almost a month, back on the East Coast to see family, so that's a nice opportunity to be able to do that. We wouldn't have otherwise, so, yep. Uh, I'm thankful for, I guess, my overall health and uh, supportive family and friends and being able to enjoy their company is really what it comes down to. <laughs> Although Thanksgiving is a little different this year, it's important to remain thankful and grateful for what you have. As you can see, Amherst residents have found ways to find the silver linings in what could be a quite bleak situation. For the Amherst Weekly Report, I'm Melissa Torres. This Thanksgiving, Local food banks and centers in the area are giving back to the community and helping provide meals and services for residents. For on or off campus students at UMass Amherst, the Amherst Survival Center distributes fresh and nutritious food for students in the area. Places like POGH or Pentecostals of Greater Hartford have a Thanksgiving food drive through Sunday, November 22nd. Non-perishable items such as canned foods, potatoes, rice, kidney beans, gravy packets, and stuffing will be collected through Saturday, November 14th. Whole chicken and turkeys will be collected from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Sunday, November 22nd. The Thanksgiving food giveaway will be from 2.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. on Sunday, November 22nd. They will have family dinner kits available. Margaret's Pantry, Not Bread Alone Soup Kitchen, and the Food Bank of Western Mass are some of many places in our area providing warm meals and non-perishable goods for local residents. If you aren't able to donate or participate in local food drives, you can always volunteer and donate your time to provide for people and families in need during this time. Although Black Friday isn't until the 27th of November, there are many sales and deals happening right now. Some of the biggest items this year are the iPhone 12, Nintendo Switch, and the Apple Watch Series 6. With COVID-19 still very active across the state, this year your shopping experience might look different. So online shopping is the best way to stay safe and socially distant from the comfort of your home. Many stores like Target, Walmart, and Best Buy are having Black Friday deals now until Cyber Monday, so be sure to get ahead and do some early Christmas shopping for your loved ones. Be sure to also check out your local shops and boutiques to support local businesses. Bring a mask or two and practice social distancing to ensure a safe shopping experience for you and the essential workers at these stores. That's all for this week. You've been watching the Amherst Weekly Report from Amherst Media. We will not have an Amherst Weekly Report next Friday, so we will see you again after Thanksgiving on Friday, December 4th.